This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for August 24th, 2022. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm talking with Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Eric and Lindsay, one of the big breakthroughs in COVID research has been the development of antiviral agents for treating illness. These agents are particularly effective when they're used early in disease, when rapid viral replication is occurring and before considerable pathology develops. So today I'd like to talk about the role of antivirals, both in the management of individual patients and in the context of the whole outbreak. But before we talk about that, today we published a study that looked at the real world effectiveness of one of these agents, nirmatrelvir. So how was that study done? Steve, this was a retrospective observational study performed in Israel in their largest HMO, which cares for more than half of the population and almost two thirds of the elderly population. We've published several studies from this organization, CLOLIT, which has an excellent electronic medical record system that enables them to perform carefully matched cohort studies. This study was performed between January and March, a time when Omicron was the primary circulating viral variant. The authors studied all HMO members over 40 years old who were diagnosed with COVID-19 as outpatients and who had risk factors for progression to more severe disease. Almost all patients were tested because they had symptoms. Cleet had a policy where patients who met risk criteria were treated as soon as possible with nirmatrelvir as long as they didn't have contraindications. Although, as we'll see, many members of the organization did not receive drugs. The primary outcome was hospitalization due to COVID-19. The investigators also measured COVID-19-related death as a secondary outcome. The data were additionally analyzed by immune status, including vaccination status and prior infection. And then what did the researchers find? During this period, there were more than 1.1 million infections, but the vast majority of participants were ineligible for the study because of their age or their lack of risk factors. The final analysis population included almost 110,000 patients, only about 4,000 of whom received nirmatrelvir. Patients were treated a median of two days after their diagnosis, and the vast majority completed the full five-day course of therapy. So how well did it work? There appeared to be a substantial difference between younger and older patients, with there being little difference in hospitalization rates in treated and untreated patients who were younger than 65, but about a fourfold decrease in hospitalizations for older individuals. A similar difference was seen in death rates. Not surprisingly, lack of prior immunity was a substantial risk factor for hospitalization. This is a retrospective study and as such could be susceptible to a number of biases. Chief among these is the fact that most eligible patients did not receive nirmatrelvir, and we don't know if these patients are systematically different from those who are treated. Nevertheless, the results do appear to make sense. Drug therapy has limited value in preventing hospitalization in lower-risk people, but is effective in higher-risk groups, particularly those who are older and lack immunity to SARS-CoV-2. So, Steve and Eric, I think these data help us see the value of comprehensive healthcare systems that have large medical records that are integrated and organized to be able to look for effects of new therapies as they're rolled out, such as, in this case, the use of nematrelvir in the setting of the Omicron surge. So there were large numbers of individuals infected, and they were able to see the potential benefit. There are challenges intrinsic to this kind of approach. The treatment, as you pointed out, Eric, was in a small number of individuals who are likely at risk, in part related to availability of drug as it was being scaled up and rolled out. This raises important questions about how representative are those treated versus those not treated who are eligible. Whether this bias is in the direction of those who are sicker were treated earlier, or those who had increased health-seeking behaviors sought out treatment earlier, makes it complex to fully interpret how these forces may impact the observations. However, overall, the data makes sense in that those who are at higher risk for severe complications benefit more from treatment than those who are at lower risk, which points out the issue of what is the absolute, not relative benefit as an important factor to consider as we look at the benefit of a therapy. Presumably, the side effects are likely equal across individuals treated, while the benefit may be differential depending on the risk of progression. 
And that becomes important here as we see in the older individuals and those who lacked immunity are more likely to benefit because they're more likely to get severely ill. And therefore, we have to pay attention to relative versus absolute benefits as we try to interpret these data in our clinical practice. One of the interesting pieces to come out of this study was that 97% of people were able to complete therapy. That's a very high compliance rate. I'm not sure if that has to do with the fact that people realized that this was a scarce resource and really wanted it, or if within the confines of this particular healthcare system, there was the ability to help patients comply. In either case, it does suggest that most people can tolerate this medication. As you know, Lindsay, the major issue with it is bad taste, along with drug interactions. But certainly the complaint we get from patients is that it doesn't taste good. And yet most people are able to take the drug and complete the full course of therapy. So given all of this, how do these data help physicians make the decision to use nermatrelvir or not? Steve, this study seems to confirm the idea that nermatrelvir is useful in people at high risk, but probably not all that useful in people at lower risk of disease progression. It's always tempting to use an antiviral in everyone, and there is some suggestion, certainly anecdotally, that people's symptoms resolve somewhat more quickly on the antivirals, and that in some cases might be a reason to use it. But remember that as we use this drug or any other antiviral, we're also selecting for antiviral resistance. And so there is a very good reason to try to limit this drug to where it will be most effective, and that's in this high-risk population. So Eric, I agree that these data support the benefit in those who are at highest risk for progression to severe illness. Those who are at higher risk, however, are changing. For the first year, it was largely those who are non-immune. As we were rolling out vaccines, and as the virus was spreading, there still were large swaths of the population who were uninfected or unvaccinated. And these data support the benefit in those who are non-immune. However, as most of the population in the globe have either been vaccinated or infected, that risk group is changing. We don't fully appreciate the durability of vaccine protection or the protection from natural infection. However, it still is likely protective, even in the context of lowering immunity as measured by titers, as T cells and other types of antibody responses may play a role. So I think we are in a different place than the initial establishment studies that allowed us to understand the benefit of nematrelvir, which was in the non-immune. But there still are others, as you suggest, Eric, who are at high risk, who have risk factors for severe illness, particularly those who are older and those with severe comorbidities that impact immune function, be it diabetes, immunosuppressive medications, cancer, transplantation, many of these conditions that unfortunately are all too common. So there will be a role, I think, in the use in those higher risk populations, but it still has to be defined. I don't think we have the data to provide enough clarity on exactly how to use it in those higher risk populations. But I do think the data support that they're at higher risk for disease progression. Many may be at higher risk for failure to develop adequate immune response to vaccination or infection, and therefore need to be thought about in terms of earlier treatment with effective antivirals. But I'm certain more research is going to emerge that will help us to better understand those populations at risk so we can then use these kinds of treatments to benefit, especially in preventing disease progression. There's one other feature that we've all been talking about, although not yet in this podcast, is the side effects from treatment or from viral infection or perhaps from both, which include not only the taste, as you mentioned, and the drug interactions, but also rebound. And we don't understand exactly who's at risk for rebound and what all the clinical consequences of viral rebound are. But whether or not treatment impacts that is something we're going to have to learn more about, because in those who are not at the highest risk for severe illness, that becomes a complicating factor on many levels that we will have to better understand and define so it can be part of our risk-benefit calculation when we treat our patients. That's a great point, Lindsay. 
we don't really understand rebound in the initial efficacy study there was a very low rate of rebound but we hear anecdotally of many many cases of rebound most of which don't result in very severe disease leading to hospitalization but people do get sick and of course they continue to shed virus which might make them infectious to their family and coworkers for a much longer period of time so i think that is a consideration Remember that the choice of five days of therapy is relatively arbitrary. We don't know if a longer course of therapy would decrease the incidence of rebound, for example, or have any other sorts of effects. But for now, that is the way the drug is being administered, and we do have to watch out for that potential issue. I agree, Eric, and I think the point that you made that we will have to pay attention to and I think require data because the current state of the literature can be interpreted either way, which is in those individuals who have virologic rebound at day 10 or 14, have recrudescence of virus and in many symptoms, are they infectious? And what is the degree of infectiousness? And that's something we need to really understand as we think about how best to control transmission and curtail further spread, which in some ways, the horse is out of the barn. Nirmatrelvir is just one of three approved antiviral agents. So how should practitioners think about how to choose which drug? Steve, you're referring to the three small molecule antiviral drugs. Of course, we have monoclonal antibodies, which are also antiviral agents of a sort. But we also have anti-inflammatory agents that are directed against the host pathological response, which can be very beneficial, particularly late in infection but these are not direct acting antiviral agents. The three small molecules we have are nermatilvir, which we're discussing now, malnipiravir, another oral medication, and remdesivir, which as of now is only available in an in intravenous formulation. The original studies we have suggest that nermatilvir is a more potent therapy than malnipiravir. And so under most circumstances, It is the drug of choice for those getting oral therapy. However, nermatrelvir is combined with ritonavir in order to prolong its serum half-life. And because of that, there are many drug interactions with drugs that are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system. So it may not be appropriate for all patients, and there may be a subset of patients for whom molnipiravir is a good choice. Remdesivir has proven to be very effective in the trials when administered to outpatients early in disease. However, it is an intravenous drug, and so the logistics of administering it are complicated. There is probably a set of patients for whom it is appropriate, those who aren't taking oral drugs, those at very high risk of disease, including some of the immunocompromised patients that Lindsay cares for. But the use of this drug is going to be restricted because of the mode of therapy. And Steve, as we think about these drugs that Eric outlined, as we think about the emergence of variants of concern, very likely they're emerging in the context of immune selective pressure, which in many ways is more likely to impact the monoclonal antibodies, as they often target a single epitope or combination of epitopes on the viral surface. The current selective pressure seems less influential in the metabolic pathways that our small molecule antiviral drugs manipulate, attack, disrupt, so that with the variant of concern emergence, we're likely to lose MABs as we have already over the last year and a half, while we haven't seen as much resistance to the small molecules. However, with broad use of these agents, that concern is going to increase. So, Eric, as you pointed out, nematrelvir is really the easiest of the agents to use, assuming there isn't a ritonavir drug interaction concern. And the other agents are often deployed in circumstances where there's specific clinical risk-benefit ratio that's favorable. But this will have to be complemented by where the monoclonals fit in as we treat our patients and look for more durable protection because the MABs, the monoclonals, often will last longer given their half-life than small molecules, which have a shorter half-life and clearance. So I think that these agents will have a availability consideration and the patient characteristics. 
As Eric mentioned, in our immunocompromised patients, it gets a lot more complicated because they don't fit in as easily into the data from the establishment studies. And they often do not have an immune system that helps clear the virus, which when I think about treating patients with antivirals, it's really the immune system that clears the virus and the antiviral helps, slows down the virus, gives the immune system more time. In our immunocompromised patients, they often don't have that immune system to clear the virus, and we've often seen prolonged infection in many of our severely immunocompromised patients. And there, we have to think about different kinds of treatment considerations. But that's an exceptional circumstance. And the majority of our patients who are relatively healthy, which I consider our patients who are older or with diabetes, are relatively healthy these antivirals can really slow the virus down and allow their immune system to clear the infection. In the past, we've talked about the relative benefits of treatment and prevention in COVID-19. Do you think of the antiviral agents as useful tools for public health? I think that depends on how you define public health. Having a disease which is less lethal is important to public health. And these antivirals can certainly decrease the lethality of disease and decrease the burden on the healthcare system by decreasing the number of hospitalizations. So in that respect, these are public health tools. However, it's unlikely that the limited use of these agents is going to have much of an effect on transmission of infection. In fact, it's conceivable that if rebound is truly a widespread phenomenon, that we could actually increase the length of infectivity for certain individuals. But in any case, the percentage of patients with infections who are going to end up being treated with these drugs is very small. Most of them have already been at the peak of transmission risk, which occurs at the very beginning of infection. And so using these drugs probably isn't going to have much of an effect at all on the ongoing rate of development of new disease. So Eric, I agree that these agents are very important from a public health standpoint in the sense of preventing our patients from getting severely ill, getting hospitalized and overwhelming the healthcare system. And we've witnessed much of that in the last year. As we think about other potential uses, it gets more complicated as we don't have the data. But there are other circumstances if we look at other respiratory viruses where we might see a role for these kinds of agents in preventing transmission, which has not been demonstrated to date. For example, studies done 30, 40 years ago with the adamantanes for influenza were able to show that individuals going into a high-risk environment, such as nursing homes or other settings where there's high transmission, use of these agents could protect healthcare workers or other care providers in that setting. So in thinking about very targeted use of individuals going into very high-risk circumstances, one could imagine, analogous to ring vaccination, but the inverse, use of agents to augment protection of those who are at very high risk of exposure. This, of course, raises issues about medication side effects, tolerability, and the emergence of antiviral resistance. But we have seen in other settings where different paradigms of use can have clinical benefit to protect healthcare workers and others. And it'll be interesting to see how studies may emerge assessing these potential benefits, assuming they're needed depending on how SARS-CoV-2 continues to transmit. I also, Eric, want to think about the issue of rebounds. I think it's a complex issue that is poorly defined at this point. And whether it's a property of treatment or is it a property of the virus that we're now beginning to understand? For example, with some of the hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola, we have learned decades later from initial outbreaks that there may be persistence in certain sanctuary sites that are able to lead to relapse disease and illness in the community. And I think we're going to need to better understand with SARS-CoV-2, are there properties of infection that lead to rebound in many, or perhaps sanctuary sites in some that may contribute to disease propagation and persistence? I think there's a lot to be learned in this setting, and we need to understand if it's a property of treatment or of the virus 
and what the implications are for better virus and illness control. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Eric.